How much do you exercise? 25% of Americans sit for longer than eight hours a day, and that puts them at a higher risk for early death. Tonight on The Best Times, we discuss the extraordinary benefits of exercise. Funding for The Best Times is provided by The Plow Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you. Hello, I'm Chris Hardaway. Welcome to this edition of The Best Times, a series that looks at life after 50. We all know that exercise is good for us, but a series of recent scientific studies has underlined the importance of exercise as we age. One study by the Cleveland Clinic followed 122,000 people over a period of 23 years, putting them through treadmill tests and recording mortality rates. They found a clear connection between a longer, healthier life and high levels of exercise. In fact, they went so far as to conclude that a lack of exercise, a sedentary lifestyle, is as harmful to us as a major disease or a lifetime of smoking. Another study at the University of Cambridge in England found that brisk walking for just 20 minutes every day could reduce one's risk of early death by as much as 30%. Maybe exercise is the fountain of youth. Bunny Lee Wilhelm knows a thing or two about exercise. As you watch her stretching and twisting herself into a pretzel, think about this. Bunny Lee is 84 years old. She has been practicing and teaching Hatha Yoga since her 20s. Today she is teaching her regular weekly yoga class at the McWhorter Senior Center. Bunny Lee is quick to extol the virtues of exercise, especially yoga. It's the best foundation a person can possibly give themselves, mentally and physically, internally and externally. It has every plush that you can think of. 60 years of regular exercise has kept Bunny Lee healthy and happy, and she credits exercise for enabling her to avoid any major illnesses. And I did not want to have all the things they're saying you get. But you don't have to have it if you do what is necessary. I take no medication internally, and so I need no prescription drugs. Because when you massage your internal organs, like when some of the positions, when you bring your leg up against your internal organs, it's going to massage those internal organs, and you're not going to be pressing down like that. They, you don't give them a chance to even work. They cannot work if they're pressing down. You've got to give them an opportunity to work. Uh -huh. and reverse that pull of gravity. All the pluses you can imagine and beyond. After nearly an hour of yoga, everyone in the room is tired but invigorated. Well into her 80s, Bunny Lee is living her life by a simple mantra. Look at me, you wanna be like me? Come on, get on the train, let's get out. If you don't use it, it's gonna be gone. At the Davis YMCA, Deborah Hines is leading a large group of seniors in a Silver Sneakers class. Silver Sneakers is a nationally recognized exercise program for people 65 plus. It's a high energy workout featuring a combination of aerobic exercise to get the heart pumping and strength movements to build muscle and bone. Deborah emphasizes that strength training is important as we age. At some point, Early in life, you start losing muscle anyway, I think around 25. So the more strength 
training you do, the more you can build strong muscles, strong bones, and that makes you look more erect when you stand, helps your posture and all that. The side benefit of exercising in a group like this is the socialization, fellowship, and support that a group provides. And as Deborah points out, exercise also addresses our emotional well-being. Not just for your physical body, I think at first you'll notice the emotional side of it, the emotional effects. You feel calmer, you may feel a lot happier, and then you'll have a lot more energy. Deborah has some constructive advice for the couch potatoes among us. Get up off the couch, and if you're going to stay on the couch, grab some water bottles, sit there, and just start flexing your biceps. Start doing some shoulder presses. Start doing something. Just march in place, and then walk around your house, and then come over to Davis Y. <laughs> Kind of difficult paddling now in this wind and rain. Look here, we all decked out. I'm the only one on the water really right now. This is Dale Sanders, who goes by the moniker of the Greybeard Adventurer. He has spent a lifetime outdoors. In the U.S. Navy, he was a hard hat diver. In 1965, he was named Athlete of the Year by the Underwater Spearfishing Association. And he held the underwater breath holding record at just over six minutes. He's backpacked and hiked around the world. Clearly, staying active has been Dale's fountain of youth. The body has to stay active. I'm absolutely convinced of that. The out of more, active and healthy and diet, if you got those three things going for you, you're gonna have a quality life. I know that more, the more I exercise and the more I participate, especially outdoor activities, the, the happier I am. In 2015, Dale set a world record, becoming the oldest person at age 80 to paddle the length of the Mississippi River, a distance of over 2,300 miles. He completed his journey in 80 days. Two years later, at age 82, Dale became the oldest person to through hike the Appalachian Trail, a distance of 2,190 miles. He spent most of 2017 hiking, starting in January and finishing in October. Living an active life keeps Dale Sanders young for his age, and he has a message for people in their 50s and 60s. I'm speaking to the generation before me, 50s and 60s. Those people, if they, if they prepare themselves now, like I did, they will be and they can be doing the same things I'm doing now at 80 and 81. Can we all be active into our 80s like Dale Sanders? To find out more about the science of aging and exercise, I spoke with two experts in the field. Let me begin with a couple of statistics. The CDC reports that 25% of Americans sit for more than eight hours a day. And on the other side of the coin, there was a, a study in the Journal of, American, of the American Medical Association, and the conclusion there was that a sedentary lifestyle is the equivalent of having a major disease, and that the simplest cure is exercise. Now, what this tells me is that if exercise were a pill, we'd all take it, wouldn't we? We'd all take it. Why, why don't we exercise if we know those facts? I think that's a great question. Um, that knowledge behavior gap uh, is tremendous. We know what we need to do and we don't do it. Um, there are many, many answers to that. One is probably um, a common one is we don't enjoy it. A lot of people just don't enjoy exercise. Uh, they may not enjoy uh, being sweaty. They may not enjoy the feeling of pushing themselves. Um, they may not enjoy changing clothes, you know, just getting up and doing it. So it becomes somewhat of a hassle. Well, maybe we should define what is exercise in the mm -hmm. context of someone who's 50 plus. How would you define exercise? Does it have to be sweating, no pain, no gain? So for my viewpoint, no, it doesn't. So exercise is really just a continuum of activity. So if we're active, if we're breathing, we should be active. That's what our cells <laughs> want to so. be. Yes. That's what uh, we should be about. 
exercise in most people's minds is it's a defined task that I have to get to and then I get to check off a box and go do something that I'd like to do. But it doesn't have to be that at all. It can be something as enjoyable as I'm just going to get up and walk around the block, enjoy the morning and see the flowers and the trees, or take my dog for a walk. It could be something that, that is much less than just I have to tick a box and I have to get to the gym to do that. And I think we have to, to think about exercise as really being part of a lifestyle, not just something that I must do that I know is good for me, but I don't really want to do it. Do you get as much benefit from the things you just mentioned, sort of exercising as part of your daily activities versus going to the gym or running laps around the track? You do, but it's volume dependent. It's also intensity dependent. So if you have 10 minutes at the gym or 10 minutes of a walk, it depends on what the angle of your treadmill might be or how flat the ground is around your place. It's just a matter of really picking the pace up a little bit, um, not necessarily uh, thinking about it as being I must jog. You don't have to jog to get benefits from exercise. You just have to move and move for a period of time. Um, and how long you move and how intense you move is really defining on, on your age parameters, what your condition is and what your goals are. Can it be as simple as um, instead of taking the elevator two floors up, you walk? I mean, is it as simple as that? I think it's as simple as trying to be um, active and trying to decrease the amount of time you're sitting. One of the things that you just mentioned mm -hmm. is that we sit more than eight hours a day. So one of the things that we see in many office places is that now we stand. So being aware of how much we're sitting and decreasing the time we're sitting in whatever method or mode that may be is better than sitting all day. Uh, once you get past that, then certainly any activity is better than none. And the more that we can incorporate those steps and the walking and um, being active um, on an everyday basis, the better off we are. Well, I have read before that we as humans were designed to move. I mean, is that mm -hmm. correct? That, that's absolutely correct. Our, our bodies were designed to move. Our cells in the, each of the organs that we have are designed for us to move. They're generating energy from little organs that are called uh, mitochondria, and those are very much um, problematic as we age. And so exercise and, and aging are all impacted back to the cellular level, and the way that we are designed is to move. Well, now that you tell me we need to move, let's talk about what the benefits are of moving. What, what are some of the basic benefits of getting up and exercising? Well, I think immediately, um, by getting up and moving, we obviously increase in blood flow, we increase heart rate, uh, and with that, with the increase in blood flow, we're going to have, uh, hopefully, a decrease in the amount of glucose in your blood. You can, depending on, again, the volume and the intensity and things that we're doing, uh, we can see pretty acute responses, immediate responses from exercise bouts. Immediate responses? Mm -hmm. In other words, 10 minutes after I, I sure. exercise, I feel better. Um, hopefully you'll feel better. <laughs> a lot of times it requires us thinking about that though. You know, most of us when we exercise and when we stop exercising, we're not sitting there thinking, oh, how did I feel before and how do I feel now? And I think that's one of the um, motivators that we can use to get ourselves to do more, is to be aware of, our, of how, how we're feeling, to be aware of what's going on, and to kind of monitor that and check that off. Now, That's exercise, a good strategy. Exercise can strengthen muscles, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, even bones, the right kind of exercise. Mm -hmm. uh, does it strengthen our immune systems? Does it give us a, a little bit of protection against possible disease? It's a, it's a very much of a, a medicine. American College of Sports Medicine defines exercise as medicine. That's their slogan, and truly it is for all cells in the body. So yes, it does benefit the skeletal muscles. So as we age, we lose muscle mass. That impacts glucose metabolism, impacts our ability to potentially get diabetes. All those kinds of things are benefited from that. However, obviously the heart it benefits from exercise, but so does bone, so does the brain, so do the blood vessels, so does the liver, so does pretty much every cell that you can think about because all these cells talk to each other. They're not just one muscle sitting in one place not thinking about what's going on in the brain. It turns out that the muscle is always sending signals to the brain and vice versa. Can, can exercise improve cognitive function? 
It can. Um, it, it's used a lot in, in Alzheimer's. Um, it, it, it actually improves and protects against stroke injury. So by, by having exercise as being a systemic environment, so you asked about um, you know, inflammation and, and that type of thing, that can be a whole body effect. So by having less oxidative stress, by having the environment in, in the blood and in the cells, for the brain, you can have improved cognitive function. There's many studies that show that depression and, and outlook and basically quality of life is improved, which are all cognitive events associated with aging. One of the best stress relievers is exercise. Now, it doesn't always happen just, you know, I, I'm mad, therefore I'm gonna go out and do a run. Well, that sometimes is good. But long-term effects are really, really, I think, what we're after, so we don't get to be in a poor condition overnight. We're not going to necessarily get to Mount Olympus overnight either, but we have to look at what our goals are and make some clear plans and then try to get there one step at a time. But I think when, when you're moving there, within a week or two, you, you will see and feel a difference. It'll be very, very rapid. You'll be surprised and um, it'll be a pleasant uh, environment for all your cells. I have seen studies that they reported that uh, exercise will help us sleep better, and I th I've also seen studies that recognize that in terms of good health, sleep is just as important now as diet and exercise. Will exercise help me sleep better? Um, it can certainly help you sleep better. Uh, you have to be a little bit careful in the time of day that you exercise. You, you're not gonna wanna go out and exercise really hard late in the day because that may energize you more yeah. than getting to sleep. But certainly being able to expend the energy and to uh, improve your sleep to where you can stay asleep longer instead of having those intermittent times when you're waking up in the night uh, is something that we want to see from regular chronic exercise that we do on a continuous basis, yeah. There was a study that uh, was published in the British Journal of Sports Medicine and it said, their conclusion was that 10 minutes of exercise a week is linked to longer life. I mean, that's, that's a little over two minutes a day. Uh, it seems almost impossible. Is it true? Well, so their, their data showed that that was sort of the inflection point where 10 minutes created a difference in longevity. But what their data also showed that if you exercise for 30 minutes, then you would have a decrease of, of uh, incidence of uh, death by 17%, and if you had that same 30 minutes and exercise more rigorously, there'd be a 33% less likely chance of, of death. So yes, any exercise is gonna be beneficial, but if we modulate that and say, okay, let's get serious a little bit about this, do a little bit more, you'll have a lot better benefits. So in other words, get an introduction, do the 10 minutes a week and work your way up. Yes, and, and be reasonable about it. Again, we don't want to get to the place where we're trying to overdo it um, because as we age, recovery from injuries and those types of things are much slower, so we have to be very sensible about that. But we ramp it up slowly, and then once we get there, yes, it's going to be some very beneficial effects as a result of that. Yeah, don't expect to run a four-minute mile first time out. <laughs> uh, let's talk about a couple of types of exercise and the uh, the... Uh, the, the role they play in aging well, aerobic exercise. How important mm -hmm. is aerobic exercise to us as we age? Well, aerobic, I, as we age, we need the same kinds of exercise as we do at all points in our lives. So uh, everyone needs aerobic exercise, something where we're increasing the heart rate. With that increase in the heart rate, we're getting a, a long-term increase in blood flow and all of the benefits uh, from the cardiovascular and respiratory system. With that, we also get the boost in uh, caloric expenditure, which many people are concerned about with trying to maintain or lose weight. Um, you're getting the benefits of the cognitive benefits and the mood benefits that we talked about earlier. So all of those have direct connections with the aerobic exercise and cardiovascular exercise. One of the other nice things that, that have been just published about aerobic exercise, if we just pop back to there, but sure. aerobic and, and, and um, um, resistance training may do the same thing, is that there are little caps on the end of, um, of chromosomes called telomeres, and these telomeres are linked very much to aging. So as we age, these telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter, and these are to protect DNA from damage and oxidative stress, and once they go away, the cell basically dies. A recent study that was just published this past uh, year in, in uh, January 
in the British uh, Journal of, of Heart is show by Michael Werner's group in Germany showed that if you exercise aerobically either by, in, in their groups, they took 124 people, they split them into two groups, an interval training and a, a, a jogging exercise, and it was a 45 minute kind of an exercise. But they measured increases in telomere length from those aerobic trained people. Uh, what that suggests is that they're really rolling back the biological clock. The things that, that are associated with shorter lifespans are now being reversed by aerobic training. Mm -hmm. Now what about strength training? I've, we I've read that we need strength training as we age. Why? So there, there's really two primary reasons. With one of the reasons that skeletal muscle deteriorates with aging is that these mitochondria that are energy producing cells in, in muscles, in heart, in all cells, deteriorate, they become very leaky. And when they become leaky, they're, they're toxic. And when we're young, we've got a really nice system for removing these, these toxic mitochondria but they end up being like garbage when we're aged. They just sit around and they become toxic and the cell will eventually die. Now the neat thing about exercise is that it turns on all the machinery to start getting rid of the garbage. So those sick mitochondria that are leaking, they get moved out of the way and it builds new mitochondria. And those new mitochondria are the things that give us more energy and then allows us to have, have the tools to be able to start growing muscle if we need to, to stop the, the muscle wasting. And, and basically, everything works much better that way. So exercise is really turning, getting rid of the, the sick mitochondria, creating new mitochondria. Then on top of that, exercise and certainly resistance training itself also affects this mitochondria piece, as does aerobic training. But there's also some pieces to, to slowing the, the whole sarcopenic process of muscle wasting with aging because, and data from our lab and, and many other labs have shown that resistance training can really roll back that biological clock, maybe up to 20 years. Can't do probably much more than that. But but does roll it That's back. That's a lot. <laughs> it, it's a important. Lot. But if you have someone who's regularly exercising and he's a, he or she is a 60 year old, they can function, and you can do the measurements very much like a 40 year old. But let's go through the decades. What, what sort of exercise would you recommend in the 50s, 60s, and then 70s beyond? Well, again, I think that um, what's appropriate for most people in the 60s are the same thing as appropriate in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and younger too. We need something aerobic. Now we have to keep in mind that as we age, we may have more, uh, we may be more susceptible to some injuries. We may have some joint pains. We may have uh, some limitations that have come with age. And with those limitations in mind, we want to make sure that our exercise is appropriately fit mm -hmm. with our limitations. But something aerobic so, really simple as walking. I was going to say, we are doing, I would recommend some kind of, maybe start out with walking, but there's nothing to prevent an elderly person from jogging or running if their body is appropriate for that. If, if they have no injuries and they can move forward with that. Same thing with weightlifting, absolutely appropriate to perform weightlifting as long as it's not associated with any increases in injuries. Um, I think how you design that program, the weightlifting program and the aerobic program uh, should be an individual consideration to where if we're going to look at high intensity, um, long duration is going to be dependent on an individual's own health risk. Is uh, it something that should be discussed with their doctor? Absolutely. Um, for most of us, we need to make sure that it's appropriate for where we are in life. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, HIIT training is very popular right now, high intensity interval training, and it has had some really good results. Um, for most people, it will be fine. I would say that most people need to make sure they're cleared for that before they try to embark that. All right, last question. Um, is exercise the fountain of youth? In, in my mind, there is no fountain of youth. <laughs> um, again, we think maybe 20 years is what you can roll back the biological clock, but you cannot stop aging. In, in our labs, we've never, and nobody, no one that I've ever seen published data would suggest that you can stop all aging in all cells. You, you can slow it and you can reverse many of those things to the point, but then they will progress as aging continues. But that's an important piece. If we can regain the, the quality of life and, and function as if we're 20 years younger, then I think that that's still well worth the investment. And I think it is an investment in, in what's truly important in, in our well-being to make this part of 
of our existence. If it were in a pill, we'd all take Absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's the bottom line. Okay. I want to thank both of you for being on the best thank times. You. I appreciate it. Thank you. Want more information about life after 50? Go online to watch more shows and find more resources. And send us your feedback and story ideas to besttimes at wkno.org. That's all for this edition of The Best Times. Please join us next week for more stories about life after 50. Until then, I'm Chris Hardaway. Thanks for watching. Good night. Funding for The Best Times is provided by the Plough Foundation, striving to do the greatest good by helping the greatest number of people since 1964. Additional funding is provided by the members of WKNO. Thank you.